compared to if your diet only consisted of protein, veggies, and good whole milk. Who is going to be healthier? Who's going to be stronger? Who's going to be more likely to run a marathon based solely upon what they are consuming, what they are bringing into their body? We realize very quickly that one diet is superior to the other, and it's not merely just that you maybe prefer the taste of one over the other, but it has a great impact on your life and your fruitfulness and what you're able to do based on what you consume, right? This is a natural part of reality that we all realize. But we must realize that even spiritually, we become what we feast on. Spiritually speaking, we are what we eat, so to speak. What we consume, what we bring in, what fills us up will be on display within our Christian life as we walk with the Lord. And we'll see a beautiful picture of this Christian consumption as we come to God's word this morning. So let us go no further. Look in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, God's word for us this morning. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. The days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good, inerrant, sufficient, all-powerful word that you've given to us this morning, Lord. We pray that as we come under your word, we would humble ourselves under it, we would submit ourselves to it, we'd be transformed by it, that we would see that it is the bread of life that will satisfy us eternally, that it is a wellspring that seeks for us to never um, be thirsty again. So Lord, would we come with that hunger and that thirst to your word this morning? Would we come ready to be filled up with what you would have to feed us through your spirit and not be filled up with the things of the world that leave us hungry? And so Lord, would you help us in these things? Would you guide us as we study your scriptures and would it all be to your honor and to your glory? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we work through these verses, we'll work in three main sections. They all start with W, so I got my Baptist alliteration checkmark for this morning of accomplishing that part of the sermon. It is wisdom in verses 15 through 17, wrath in the first part of verse 18, and worship in the second part of 18 through 20. So wisdom, wrath, and worship. As we begin, let's consider these first few verses in wisdom as we see verses 15 through 17. Now in this, we see that the Apostle Paul is calling us again to walk. He's calling us to walk. Now this is not the first time he's done this in the book of Ephesians. In fact, this is actually the last time he will explicitly say this, but we see him say it the first time in Ephesians 2 verse 10, in light of this wonderful salvation that God has given to his people by grace, through faith, not a result of works. In Ephesians 2.10, he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then going into chapter 4, verse 1, as we really move from the doctrine section of the book into the duty or the Christian living section of the book, we are told in the first verse of that to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And then verse 17 of chapter 4, he says, no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Chapter 5, verse 2, he says to walk in love. And then last week, as we were studying God's word, he told us to walk as children of the light. Well, now as we see the apostle calling us in these verses to walk in wisdom, which is really his final call to walk in this book with the exception of him detailing the shoes and the armor of God that we will see at the end of this epistle to the Ephesians. But here we are called to walk in wisdom. Listen again what it says in these first few verses. Verse 15 says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord 
is. We're called to walk as the wise in these verses, not as the unwise, but as those who are wise. And as we consider how do we walk in wisdom in light of what God is making us new in, in the gospel, we must understand that there are two different paths as it pertains to wisdom and folly. You are walking with the wise or you are walking with the foolish. And the path of folly is the easy path. It's the prominent path, even in what's declared in these verses. It says, the days are evil. In other words, you don't have to look very far to find the path of folly. It's very easy to find it. It's the easy road in many ways. It's the one that's expedient, the one that is right in front of us. It's easy to do what foolish people do, and it certainly is easy for us. Now, note that this does say that the days are evil, and it's very easy for us to read that and immediately think of the latest news headline that is evil, and it's not hard to come across. I think it's certainly appropriate for us to read this and go, yeah, there's quite a bit of evil and sin in this world still for us today, but it's helpful to remember that he was writing this to a church 2,000 years ago, and he was reminding them that the days are evil. Sometimes our perspective is too narrow, okay? God's people has suffered through cultural sin for a long, long time. If you don't believe me, read the book of Genesis, okay? Things got pretty bad pretty quickly. It's been evil for a long time, and God's people have to learn how to walk in wisdom in light of the sin around them. The path of folly is an easy one to take, but as God's children, as those who have been redeemed, as his saints, as members of the household of God, he calls us rather to walk the path of wisdom. God calls us as his image bearers, purchased by his son, to be wise sages in our life, to practice and to exercise embodied wisdom. But what is this biblical wisdom that he's calling us to do? Well, in short, it's a few key things to consider as you consider what is biblical wisdom. The first is to know what God's law says. If you're going to be a wise person in God's eyes, you have to know what God's word and his law says. Listen to what it says in verse 17 that we're in. Therefore, do not be foolish, but what's the contrast to this folly? Understand what the will of the Lord is. If you want to not walk with the fools, you have to know what God's law says. You will not exercise true wisdom unless you know what God's standard is. But you can't only know what God's law says, what his moral standards are. You have to also know the law giver. You have to know the God who is the giver of his good law if you want to exercise true biblical wisdom that God is calling us to. You will not exercise true wisdom in life unless you are connected to the fount from whom all wisdom and goodness and truth and beauty flows. You can't expect to be wise and be detached from the source of all wisdom. That will not work for you. So you got to know God's law. You have to be connected to the God's the, or to the law giver, God Himself. And the third thing we see in this is that you have to understand God's good world. Wisdom is a natural discipline. And what I mean by that is that those who wield it have an understanding of the natural world, the world that God created and how they are to exist in it. They understand how things work and why. They understand what makes people tick and what they're doing. They understand how to read a room if they are truly wise, and they also understand the process and the order of things. And this is not necessarily something that when I say you have to have an understanding of God's creation, that you have to have a bunch of degrees hanging on your wall, it means that you have to be a student of God's world in light of knowing who he is and what he's spoken. And then you look around and you see his handiwork and his creation everywhere that you know it's good and you make determinations based on this world that you know. So if you are to exercise biblical wisdom, you have to know some things. You have to know God's law, you have to know the lawgiver, and you have to know about God's word, but is wisdom merely knowledge? Is wisdom merely knowing the right answers for a test in order for you to be able to pass it? Well, no, this walking in wisdom and not walking in folly is knowing those things and then knowing how to exercise them in obedience, in practice, in your daily lives. 
King Solomon was not merely a wise man because he knew the right answers, but because he knew how to apply God's word to real flesh life situations. As people came and sought counsel from him, he was able to engage and take God's law and know who God was and take the situation and be able to work through that biblically and wisely and to live accordingly. But so much more than King Solomon, the great man of wisdom, the Lord Jesus is a great example for us on the expression of the perfection of biblical wisdom. None of the scribes or Pharisees knew the law better than Jesus. They tried to stump him time and time again, and he always knew it better than they did. And certainly none of them knew God better than he did, being that he was a member of the Godhead. So certainly he had that in order. But as well, none of them exceeded the Lord Jesus in his righteousness. He not only knew God and knew God's law, but he put these things that he knew in his understanding of the world into practice. And that is the glory of the incarnate God in Jesus Christ, that he fulfilled all righteousness. He did the law perfectly, never sinning, not even once perfectly obeying the will of God. But he not only lived righteously, what do we see him do throughout his ministry? He instructs others in wisdom and he's constantly calling out folly. He doesn't keep it to himself, but he applies these things he knows and teaches others in them. He is a perfect example in every way of how we are to walk in wisdom. And thus, if you want to know what does wisdom look like, look at Christ, the image of the invisible God. Gaze upon him, study him, and you will learn wisdom. But how do these things relate to Christian consumption as I opened with? Moreover, why in the next verse does the Apostle Paul take a pivot and going from walking it with the wise, walking as wise, no, understand what the will of the Lord is, to talking about drunkenness, and then immediately pivot from drunkenness to talk about psalm singing? You might say, those are kind of random things to bounce around from, Paul. What are you getting at? Well, in simple terms, I believe he is contrasting here the difference between walking in folly and walking in wisdom. He's showing what it looks like to walk as a wise person filled up with the Spirit of God and using that idea of filling or consumption as an illustration on the wise Christian life of what it looks like in practice. That being filled with debauchery or being filled with the Spirit. So let's begin by seeing the foolish who only consume wrath in these verses. Look at with me at the first part of verse 18. It says, and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery. And do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery. Here we see those that are consuming wrath upon themselves. Now, depending on the translation of the Bible you're looking at, that last word might get translated a few different ways. In some of your Bibles, it may say, um, and do not, or, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, or your Bible might say, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. And this word that's used here for either debauchery or excess or dissipation, it's used in three other places, um, or three places in the Bible, including this one. And it has a number of different ways in which the English translators will translate this understanding of what this is to be drunk with wine, what it causes. In different ways this will get translated is being riotous being unruly, engaging in wild living, or the most common of dissipation, excess, and debauchery. So what's the picture here? The word chosen by the apostle is a very incisive one. And it's one that I think, and the only reason I shared some of those different translations is it's a word that is, in some sense, is hard for us to capture in a single English word. It carries with it a whole host of concepts and ideas packed into this. That's not merely sinful. It's not just saying getting drunk is a bad idea, you should avoid it, but it's carrying with it this excessiveness as well, that it's excessively out of control. It's not merely unwise, but it's characteristic of an out of control lifestyle as a whole. It is what those who are riotous and unruly do is the idea behind this world. It's an exhibition of wild living. And that is all that's contained within that Greek phrase of, for that is debauchery. 
Now, for a little while here, we're going to talk in detail about wine and alcohol, and we will do so in a fairly straightforward manner, but I think it's helpful here to stop and just say that I really believe the Apostle Paul here is trying to make a con contrast between those who walk with the wise and those who walk with the folly. And so it's wise for us, as we look at passage like this, to not merely apply this merely to the sin of getting drunk with alcohol, but to realize that whatever we fill ourselves with other than the spirit and the things that are glorifying to God will bring about our own destruction as well. What are you filling yourself up with other than Christ? Are you consuming that which is glorious or that which brings about wrath? It's a question all of us should ask because some of us may struggle with this particular sin and others not as much but I don't think that's ultimately the point he's making, but making a picture of the difference between following God and wisdom or following a life of wrath. But explicitly in this passage, we are called not to be drunk with wine. That is what he is saying. For this is debauchery, dissipation, excess. It's walking as the unwise. It is following the broad path. Why is the excessive use of wine called out here and described this way? You might ask, what's the big deal? I might have a hangover in the morning and not feel great, but why is this such a big deal to God? Why does he care so much about this? In order to understand its sinfulness, we must first see that wine is a blessing from God in the scriptures. In order to understand the sin that's being committed here, we have to first understand how God created this thing and then understand the great sin of its corruption. Listen to what it says in Psalm 105, verses 14 and 15. And note, all the other things listed here are things that we commonly would put in that blessing category from God. It says, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So here we see the psalmist praising God for good gifts of the crops growing, of the abundance of produce, of God providing bread for man, oil to make his face shine, but also, he says in there, wine to gladden the heart of man. Now, most sin ought to be understood in this category, that, God, that what we do in sin is corrupt a good gift from God. Think about how this plays out with sexual immorality or idolatry or greed or gluttony. We take a good gift that God has given us and then we corrupt it to a sinful use. And that's certainly what we see playing out with wine as well. Drunkenness is a great example of this. But how is wine a blessing exactly? Even saying that for some might be a shocking statement. How could wine possibly be a blessing? Many of us have been trained not to think of it that way, and depending on our backgrounds, uh, maybe have never heard it expressed that way from a biblical perspective. And so in saying this, I'm going to lay out some points that I believe are scriptural and biblical, but also I did put a resource out on the free resource table, uh, two parts of an article written by Jeffrey Myers that I think is really helpful in helping us understand this idea of wine and alcohol from a biblical perspective. So if you want to check me on all these things. I encourage you. That's a great resource with a ton of scripture. And here's the thing I will just say on the front end of this, guys. It's topics like this where we put a statement like that we are committed to the sufficiency of scripture to the test. Do we believe that or not? Will we live like that or not? Because culturally, these are the type of sermons that can get someone like me in trouble. But I want to be faithful to the word. I want to do what God's word says. I want to be honest here in even studying this that I'm probably going to spend an inordinate amount of time, given the verses we're in, dealing with this issue of alcohol because I have had so many conversations with genuine people asking about what is our thinking on this? How do we go to the Bible about this? And I've wrestled with this recently thinking, what does this look like in the fellowship in our church, in our lives? How do we talk about these things in a way that's helpful and engaging and edifying to the body? And thus, I think it's appropriate for us to spend some time considering it as a conversation. So let's consider from the Bible, how is wine first a blessing for then us to consider why it's so serious when we abuse it by getting drunk and alcohol more broadly really in this conversation. Well, first we see that in the Old Testament, it was a necessary sacrifice to be offered to God in worship. Now, God doesn't 
ask his people to bring forth to worship him corrupt things that are sinful. He is a holy God. And the things that are to be brought to him in worship are to be not only good things, but the best of things that we offer. We offer the first fruit of our flock. We offer the best of our flock and they were to offer the best of their wine. They were to bring this to God in worship in the Old Testament. As well, time and time again throughout the scriptures, the promised land and the prosperity of God's people was described as being an abundance of wine. That was, if it was going well for them and if and when they got into the promised land, there would be an abundance of wine where inversely, time and time again, when they were under judgment is described as the wine being removed from the people. We see that throughout the scriptures. As well, it was a key part of the communal celebrations and feast days within the Old Testament. But we see that in that, they would drink for celebratory occasions, communal celebratory um, offerings of wine together. It is particularly a sign of the celebration with the completion of work in the Old Testament, that when a work had been completed, that the the wine or the strong drink, as it talks about in the Old Testament, would be used at that time. Now note, the Bible is clear that kings and priests and these sorts of things were not to drink while they were doing the work, but only upon the completion of the work. And we'll get back to that in a little bit, but that's part of where we draw this out, that it was something only for the completion of the work. And then as we move into the New Testament, we don't see this handling of alcohol abrogated or changed, but in many ways we actually see it expanded and given greater significance. The Lord Jesus not only drank wine socially, but he provided to others at the wedding of Cana as a celebratory use of wine and full with symbolism as well, but suffice it to say that wine was provided by the Lord Jesus. But he didn't just drink socially, and I want us to wrap our heads around this. He actually commanded it of God's people to be done continually as he commanded them to drink of wine for the Lord's Supper. And one of the things in the Lord's Supper as we partake of the wine in that, that's actually a picture that one day we will take this with him in glory. So it certainly can't be sin because he promises us that one day in glory, upon the completion of his kingdom, we are going to partake of this with him. And there's not going to be any sin at that point, is there? Yet we see that he promises that one day we will partake of this with him at the Lord's table. Now, we're not getting into that, the fact that we do use non-alcoholic grape juice for this. And that's a whole nother discussion on the appropriateness of that. But suffice it to say, when Jesus gave the command, it was alcoholic wine that they're talking about. It's only very recently in church history that we would use Welch's grape juice for communion. Okay, he did command that in the Lord's Supper. And then finally, not only social drinking and religious drinking, but then even in the New Testament, we see Paul give the instruction for Timothy to drink a little wine for the sake of his stomach, using it for a medicinal purpose as well. And there's actually good research out there now that drinking a little bit of wine is good for one's health. It's consistent with the instructions that Paul gave to Timothy in order to help his health. So we must see that wine and other forms of alcohol are a blessing from God in the scriptures when used by our God as designed by our God. We cannot rightly understand the sin of drunkenness unless we first understand its intended and proper use because the sin is a perversion of that intended and proper use. But when it's corrupted, it becomes characteristic of a life of rebellion against God. Just in case you're like, he's getting a little soft on alcohol, okay? The inverse of this is very serious. If we abuse it, the sin is a great sin. It becomes the consumption of wrath rather than a blessing. Listen to how the wrath of drunkenness bears its fruit out throughout the scriptures. Again, this is not my own thoughts. This is what the Bible teaches about the dangers of drunkenness. It says it destroys one's ability to work and to take dominion. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 23, verses 20 and 21. It says, Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. It is often that drunks and drug addicts are out of work. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us if we're reading our Bible. It's not an activity that leads itself to production and to fruitful labor. 
In fact, it leads to the very opposite of that and often leads to the destruction of our ability to work and to take dominion. It also says of drunkenness that it distorts one's perception of God's good world, which, remember, is a defining aspect of wisdom that destroys this. It says, listen to what it says in Proverbs 23, 29 through 30. And in this, it's a picture of someone who is not in touch with reality in their emotions. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? And that's the key one to let us know about what's going on here. It's not just someone who's having a hard time. It's describing in this proverb someone who has wounds without cause, okay? Their perception of reality is flawed, is what's getting at here. What does it go on to say? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? It says, those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine. In other words, that if you become a drunkard, one who constantly is going to an excess of wine, it will distort your view of reality. It will distort your emotions, your ability to think clearly, to have a soberness of mind. Drunkenness does this, and it's one of the reasons why it's such a destructive sin. It also destroys good social order. You might think um, that you are the life of a party when you are drunk, but you're not. You're actually a mockery of the party. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 20, verse 1. It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. You see that the excess use of it leads us to be a mockery. Often it leads people to inordinate and uncontrolled anger, and it is not of wisdom that Proverbs clearly says. It also destroys good moral decision-making when you're drinking to an excess of wine. Look at what happened with Lot's daughters in Genesis chapter 19. They convinced their father to do something, Lord willing, he would have never done if he was sober, but he did so because he was intoxicated. We should not be surprised for us that when we drink to excess, our moral reasoning goes way out the window and we do things that we would be ashamed to do sober. And that is one of the reasons why it is such a destructive sin that we engage in. But finally, and one of the most important reasons that getting drunk with alcohol is such a horrible sin to our God is because it destroys right worship. Listen to what's happening. And this is proof that they were using alcoholic wine in the Lord's table. As we see in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 through 22, listen to how their drunkenness destroys right worship. It says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? It literally says that, a sentence in your Bible. What? Do you hear the exasperation in that? That you would come to church and at the Lord's table, you'd be getting drunk? What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. It's one of the most, you could say, unhinged the Apostle Paul gets, but it's righteous anger. What they're doing is debaucherous before our God. It's dissipation. It is excessive. It is cruel. It is horrible that they would destroy a memorial meal, a glorious sacrament of our Lord Jesus, and make it as an occasion to fill themselves up with wickedness. Brothers and sisters, we must not get drunk. It is sin. It is characteristic of a life apart from God. It destroys the good work the Lord has called you to do. It perverts your understanding of God's good world. It destroys social order. It destroys good moral decision-making. And it destroys right worship. And all of those points are coming just directly from clear passages of Scripture. We could go on to a whole host of other problems. It very well could cause you. In light of this, is complete and total abstinence the answer from what the Bible teaches? No, I do not believe it is. At a minimum, no Christian ought to object to having wine at the Lord's table, I would say. I mean, think about this. If we are in Christ, we've been washed by his blood, and we are seeking to live lives of obedience to him, is it really the wise Christian thing to do to come to God and say, actually, I don't want to partake quite told me to at his memorial feast? 
And are we really right with God if one little thimble of alcoholic drink in memorial of his blood on the cross for us would cause us to go headlong into sin? So at bare minimum, I think for the Christian, they ought to be willing in obedience to Christ's command if a church were to offer them a little thimble of wine with communion should be able to do at minimum that as a Christian as is commanded by the Lord Jesus. Now we use non-alcoholic wine, so you're not gonna have to do that moral equation in your head later. But I think at minimum, I throw that out there because I would hate for any of our people ever attending the worship service to the Lord and that's offered and they're thinking, am I allowed to drink this? God commanded it. You are certainly permitted to do that which God commands you to do as his children. But I don't think most of us struggle with that particular point as much as we do with all kinds of other social or you might say recreational forms of drinking. So I want to lay out a few categories in saying that I don't believe that total abstinence is the only faithful Christian position. What should be our guidelines as we understand the seeking to live faithfully, seeking not to get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Well, when you drink alcohol as a Christian, you must do so to the glory of God. That's the first case. And that is not debatable. It is always the case that you must do it to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I encourage you to remember that verse as we go down these stairs and enjoy a glorious meal with one another after this, that we are not to eat like unbelievers eat. We are to eat as those who are bringing glory to God. We don't drink as unbelievers drink. We drink as those who bring glory to God. Second point I would encourage you to remember, remember in this is that bad company ruins good morals, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. And saying this and saying there is a permissible time for Christians to drink, that does not mean that every occasion to drink is a wise one to do so. Okay, just because you might have that freedom in Christ doesn't mean that going to a seedy bar at 2 a.m. is a good idea for your Christian sanctification, okay? That's a bad idea. That's not going to lead to fruitfulness in your life, and I would not recommend that you do that. But it's not only where you go, it's the people that you're with. And you must understand, especially if this is a temptation for you, that trying to drink around those who do not have the biblical convictions you have is probably a bad idea, especially if you're struggling with this sin. You must realize the bad company does ruin good morals. We're told that in scripture. And we should be very aware of that. Another point we should realize in this is that sin loves the darkness. Sin loves the darkness and it flourishes in darkness. And this is one of the reasons, even though I'll be honest, it's uncomfortable for me to talk about all these things. The, one of the reasons I'm talking about this is because there's this culture in the Christian community often where drinking's okay, but do it in secret and don't talk about it. And I just think that is horribly unwise for the Christian to live that way. We're welcoming this idea of there's permissible things to do but that have a danger of sin, but don't talk about them or receive any accountability in them. Do them in secret. And that's not a wise way to live, and it's not the way that Jesus lived. Notice Jesus drank in a crowd, and then it was recorded on Scripture to be remembered forever. It was public, and we shouldn't be ashamed if we're doing it in a God-honoring way to do it in public in a way that there can be accountability as we engage in it. I will just encourage you that drinking with other believers provides greater accountability than doing it by yourself when you're alone and no one else will keep you accountable to it. We don't see drinking in isolation go very well in the scripture. What did Noah do after he got off the ark? Well, he planted himself a vineyard, he went alone in his tent, he drank by himself, and he passed out naked in his tent did not go well for him. Social drinking provides accountability. And the brothers and sisters in Christ, you have to understand, you have to hold one another accountable. If you see them being given over to excess, that is a grave sin, and you have a duty to call them out on it. It's not something that should be ignored. The stakes are great going on. Drinking in celebratory fashion and something is celebratory in fashion and should only be something that's done when the work is complete. 
There's great wisdom that we learn from both the priest and the kings. We're told not to drink while on the job because of the work that that would lead to, the judgments that that could potentially lead to. And so for you, the drinking, if ever done, should be something done as a sign of celebration and completion, not something that you would ever do on the job. Now, there's beautiful glory in this idea or this symbol of what drinking ought to be in our life as we consider the Lord's table. What are we remembering as we partake of the Lord's table and there's wine on the table? We're remembering that it is finished. It is complete. The work has been done. And so there's symbolism for that in that, but there's a great warning for us in that. Drinking on the job is never appropriate for the Christian. Finally, I just encourage you as a last point for those who would drink um, in moderation in celebratory ways to err on the side of caution. The Bible does not prescribe for us specific drink limits. It doesn't say you can only have one, you can only have two, you can only have three. It doesn't do that. It doesn't give us a certain level of blood alcohol percentages. Say so you can go up to this percent, but not any further and carry a breathalyzer around with you. Is that what the scriptures tell us? No, it doesn't. But it does clearly tell us to not get, be given over to excess. And the picture is that there is a line that can be crossed. And when that line is crossed, you are engaging in sin. So what should we do? We should err on the side of caution. The Christian morality and wisdom never in any part of our spiritual life should say, how close can I get to that line without crossing it? That is not of wisdom. We shouldn't say, well, can I just sort of straddle the line and maybe it's a gray area? Is that how the Christian should live? No, we should not go anywhere near the excess. We should not even open ourselves up to the charge of being given over to excess. We should err on the side of caution. And think about the celebratory nature of this. Have any of you been to a birthday party before? I assume you have, right? There's usually a birthday cake. Do you need to eat eight slices of birthday cake in order to have a good time? I heard yes. I got counseling to do, friends. <laughs> you don't need to have a ton to have a good time, okay? We can be reserved and enjoy a good gift in moderation and do it in a way that glorifies God and not being given over to excess. Finally, one more thing I'll say on this. Do not sin against your conscience. Romans 14, 23 says, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. Whatever, uh, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. If you're listening to me and you say, Ryan, I disagree. You are translating this wrong. You're interpreting this wrong. Drinking any form of alcohol would for me be sin. Then my loud exhortation to you is then do not drink. Do not drink. Do not sin against your conscience but rather honor the Lord with your conscience. You certainly should not just go with whatever the preacher says as well, but I encourage you to be noble Bereans. Test what I'm saying. Is it true in the scriptures? And if it is, then model your lives accordingly. If it's not, then rebuke me for it. We must be faithful to the word and we must live faithfully in these matters. So with all this talk about drunkenness and wine, we, may we not be naive in thinking about this as an abstract Bible study as well, or some moral issue for us to just debate amongst one another. And speaking on these things, I know very clearly that there's many people in here who have struggled with this sin, or even presently feel like they are struggling with temptation towards this sin. And for those who are struggling with these things, who are found in the blood of Christ, or who have previously struggled with these things, who are found in the blood of Christ, who have repented and placed their faith in Christ, I need you to hear that you are not defined as being unwise. You are not defined as being debaucherous any longer. If you repented and placed your faith in Christ, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. You are a child of the one true God, and you are a saint of the household of God. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know the, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then the glorious next few words, 
Do you know what it says? Of these people who would not inherit the kingdom of God in their lifestyle of sin, and such were some of you. And that's true in this room, of all of those things. And such were some of you, but you were washed, the scriptures say. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Can the Lord Jesus save from these sins? Absolutely. And when he does so, he transfers your identity away from that sinful identity into the kingdom of his beloved son. It's a glorious reality. Saints, your identity with sin was crucified on the cross of Christ. I encourage you to remember that as we come to the table here in a few minutes. In light of this, we must reject the modern clinical definitions that say once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. For the Christian, that's not true. That's not true. Instead, what we should say, according to the scriptures, is once a drunkard separated from the kingdom of God, now a saint and citizen of the kingdom of God. You are not defined by your past sin. You are defined by what Christ did for you on that cross. As Christians washed by the blood of Christ, we no longer need to be given over to debauchery. We no longer excessively distort God's good blessings. We no longer ought to consume wrath, but rather fill ourselves with worship, which gets us into these final few verses. Look back down at your Bibles with me. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But what ought we to be filled with instead? The Spirit. And what does this life of being filled with the Spirit look like? It is dressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we are filled with the Spirit through the gospel, through what Jesus has done for us. And because of this filling with the Spirit, we are no longer filled with debauchery, but rather filled with the Spirit of the Almighty God. And what do those who are filled with the Spirit do? Well, we see here in glorious detail that those who are filled with the Spirit praise God through song. Those who are filled with the Spirit praise God for, through song. This is not when we sing in church just for those who took choir class in high school. And this is not just for the women. Sometimes we think that in church. This is for all the people of God, men and women, young and old, children, that includes you as well. When we sing as the people of God, it is a beautiful picture of the fact that we are indwelt by the living God. So how are we to sing? Well, we learned some instruction on how we are to sing as spirit-filled people in this. It says that we are to address one another, it says first. Are we to sing just alone in our car so that no one else will hear our voice? Well, you should do that as well. That's a good time to praise the Lord. But that's not the only time you're called to praise the Lord in song. It says addressing one another. And thus, when we come on the Lord's Day to worship, we are not watching a performance up here. The people who come up are here to lead you in singing. It's congregational singing. It's addressing one another in our singing. You have a role to play. You have a Christian duty and responsibility to sing unto God when we sing together. So we sing corporately, and then we are to sing biblically. And there's this great phrase, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on what is packed into that phrasing of those three different distinctions that we just don't have time for today. But in this declaration of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, there's a few primary different ways in which people will understand this. The first is that some will argue that this means exclusive psalmody. Another way of saying that these are all different types of the biblical Psalter, and thus we should only sing the biblical Psalter exclusive, that's where that word comes from, as we gather to worship. And the best argument they will make for their point is, why wouldn't you want to sing inspired worship songs? 
And that's a good point, okay? That's why one of the reasons we love singing the Psalms as we gather. Another prominent interpretation of this would be that this extends beyond just the biblical Psalter, but is only limited to those songs contained within Scripture. So an example of that would be including things like Mary's Magnificat as an example of an appropriate song to sing in Christian worship, but still wanting to only limit it to the songs contained within the Scriptures. A final way to understand this would be to certainly include the singing of biblical songs, but also to have the freedom to sing biblically faithful and rich, robust songs, which is what we would hold as a church. But I think we ought to be careful in our modern church that often the translation we follow in this is we interpret this as saying, addressing one another with all psalms except the Psalter. And no matter what interpretation you take of this passage, there's faithful people that I disagree with on this. You cannot read this and say, that doesn't include the biblical Psalter. That's not a valid interpretation by any faithful scholar on that verse. And thus, at minimum, our, our worship should include the biblical Psalter, and that's something we're growing in. Most of us did not grow up singing it. Most of us are learning it for the first time. But by God's grace, that's sanctification. You learn to do things you didn't do before. And thus, we should learn those things together. There's a great exhortation for us to sing the Psalms and biblically faithful and rich songs. And we must always remember that as we sing them, we are not here to praise ourselves. Sometimes we think about worship music and think that we're the object of it. We're not. We are addressing one another, and we are praising the living and true God. It's not about us. It is about him in serving the body of Christ. So we must sing corporately. We must sing biblically. And then finally, we must sing sincerely. Listen to what it says. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How are we doing this? Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Can you mail it in and fake it? Is that honoring to the Lord? Let me ask you, is God more glorified by the person who sings on perfect pitch and whose heart is far from him or the person belting it out in the back? It sounds like they're getting hit by a truck, but is doing so sincerely unto the Lord. What is more honoring to the Lord? Now, I encourage you guys. I'm working on my singing. I'm rough. All right. I'm trying to improve. I, I give that illustration to feel better about myself singing. Okay. But I'm working on it, and you should too. We should grow in our singing. That is a good thing to do. But the sincerity and the faithfulness by which we offer that offering unto God is more important than singing perfectly. Don't overanalyze yourself. Sing it the best you can and sing it in faith and worship to our great God and King. We should sing corporately, biblically, and sincerely. We also see in this text that it's not limited to singing. Worship is the word I chose because partially I was trying to keep the W's going, but certainly it's contained more in this. And I don't want to communicate that worship is limited to the time we sing, but so much more than that. It goes on verse 20, what does it say? Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. That this worshipful life, this walking as the wise, is one in which we offer thanksgiving in all that we do unto our God. Another way of expressing this is that all of our life is lived unto the glory of God. It's thankful to God. It's offered as a living sacrifice unto him. It's a life of continual praise and thanksgiving. Friends, thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. That should not be the only day a year you thank our God. We should be people who are continually thanking our great God for all he's done and living in light of our thankfulness for all he has done. Those who are filled with the Spirit express Trinitarian praise and blessing. Do you see how the Trinity is interwoven in all these verses we just read? That we as God's people are filled with God's Spirit indwelling us. That we're offering thanksgiving unto the Father and it's all because of the work of the Son that this triune praise is being offered by God's people for God's glory because of all that God has done. Friends, do you want to walk in wisdom? What are you consuming? Are you being filled up with the Spirit, pouring out praise and, or consuming debauchery and pouring out wrath? There is no in-between. 
There's no neutrality in this area. We are either walking wisely or foolishly to God's glory or to our shame. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as your people to walk faithfully unto you, to walk as the wise and not as the unwise, to be filled with that which is good in edifying and building up to others, that we would conduct ourselves in a way that brings you glory, that we would run from sin and run towards righteousness. Lord, would you help us to think rightly and to live rightly, and would all that we do be done to the glory of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.